So I'm continuing my focus on practicing in the field of relationships, drawing on both the Buddha's wisdom about that and what I've learned as well through modern clinical psychology and, and recently uh, brain science. Tonight I want to talk about what has been definitely in the top five for me personally, uh, practices in the context, in the field of my own long relationship with my wife, nearly 40 years now, as well as in the field of all kinds of other relationships too. And that is this notion that I use the awkward title for of unilateral virtue. Let me tell you what I mean by that. And it might help if you reflect on some tricky relationships you've got, family, in-laws, frenemies, <laughs> enemies, <laughs> maybe friends, adult kids, young kids, you know, a significant relationship that's maybe got some, some issues in it. And think about applying what I'm talking about here, there. So I've worked with a lot of couples and they walk in the door, they want things to be better. Maybe one of them was sort of dragged in. Okay, either way, they're there in the office. And fairly quickly, we surface, we identify this dynamic, let's say there's A and there's B, in which essentially A has communicated to B, I'd like you to change in these ways. B says something like, well, okay, but I'd like you to change in those kind of ways. And then A says, okay, I'll change if you change. And then B says, you first, right? And then they get stuck. They get blocked in making the changes or making the efforts that in their heart feel reasonable and skillful and appropriate, enlightened self-interest, if nothing else. But they get stymied and blocked in taking the action that they actually could take because you know they're waiting for the other person or they're making their own good efforts contingent upon dependent upon what the other person does. To break out of that deadlock, we can practice what I call the 80-20 rule. These numbers are approximate. Put 20% of your attention, sure, on influencing the other person to be better and do better. Fine, try to persuade them to do their share of the housework, uh, try to ask in a heartfelt and skillful way for the a kind of um, attention and respect that you'd appreciate and, and in fact deserve. Okay, do what you can with that 20% focus on them, but let the remaining 80% of your focus be on what you can do yourself, according to your own code, to be a better fill in the blank, employee, employer, son, parent, daughter, brother, sister, beyond gender, a better person altogether. You know, what's, what do you think is on your list as you identify it? The benefits of this stance, this unilateral virtue stance, where you're saying, at least for a while, I'm going to unilaterally um, do better. I'm going to unilaterally take maximum reasonable responsibility for your wants, your complaints, your grievances, your requests toward me. I get to decide for me what I think is maximum reasonable responsibility, but I'm going to do that. And I'm going to do it for a while, no matter what you do. I'm not going to let you push me around or beat me up or dominate me. That said, I'm going to really, really do a good job here in this relationship. And then after some reasonable amount of time, measured in weeks at least, not days, I'm going to see what you do. And I'm going to see what happens. I don't mean that as a threat. And you don't have to utter these words if it's not appropriate. It's just a fact. Of course, you're going to see what they do. And then, you know, you're going to decide based on what they do, what at that point you do, you consider for yourself to be appropriate unilateral virtue. Okay? So the benefits of this stance are really, really multiple. One, it, it involves a sense of agency. Suddenly, instead of being at the effect of them, controlled by what they do, you're in control of what you choose in terms of thought, word, and deed in this relationship. You decide. That itself moves you out of being helpless to 
you have your own plan, you're taking agency, you have a sense of efficacy, you know what you're doing. Second, um, it you know puts you in the moral high ground. You're taking care of your side of the street, you're doing what's appropriate, and it puts you into a position where over time you can genuinely say to the other person, hey, I've handled my stuff, I've handled my stuff, and here's what I'd like from you. It puts you in a much stronger position there. Also, pragmatically, if you really do respond to the reasonable grievances, requests, unmet needs of the other person, if you really do start showing up, if you really do start carrying your end of the log, cleaning up your own side of the street, if you really start refraining from certain inflammatory things, including my own notorious eye rolls that my wife has called me on a million times, um, if you really do start to refrain from, from those things, you're removing provocations. You're no longer pouring salt on the wounds, you know, and the wounds can have a chance to heal, right? Which over time, it's not perfect, it's not a guarantee, but often does tend to promote better behavior, including toward you, on the part of the other person. Right? So many, many benefits around unilateral virtue. This stance of unilateral virtue is very consistent with the teachings of the Buddha. On the one hand, he made it clear that there's a place for recognizing injustice, absolutely, and naming it and calling it out. And there are some famous stories of the Buddha himself or, or followers in his way after he, after he died, uh, talking to kings with the power of life and death right on the spot and speaking to kings in a way that was quite courageous and unafraid, um, naming you know, the facts of the matter that were relevant at the time. So there are places for that. The Buddha was, was someone who was prepared to say, there's no wisdom in arguing with a fool. And it, there are you know, teachings in which he starts by saying, oh, foolish person. And then he starts you know, helping them see you know, things in a better way. So there's a place certainly for recognizing the way it is. We're not, <coughs> we're not giving up our rights. We're not waiving our rights or giving up on what we need. But on the other hand, we're just really taking care of our own business. And um, he stressed, the Buddha stressed again and again and again, that the call to love and kindness, the call to compassion is unconditional. It's not based on good treatment by other people. Now, we may distance from other people. We may engage in social action against other people. Think how effectively the Dalai Lama, for example, has played his very limited hand of cards uh, with regard to the Chinese government for over 50 years. Uh, you know, we can do things that are skillful, certainly, uh, while still practicing unilateral compassion and loving kindness um, with regard to other people. So there's the real emphasis there in Buddhism, certainly, including in the famous opening lines to the Dhammapada that essentially says, mind is the maker of all things, certainly the maker of all reactions. And as our mind inclines, the rest of us follows. And it's up to us individually to incline, to incline our mind in a good direction. So, okay, great. Sounds good, Rick. Yeah, sure. How to actually do it, including with the <laughs> nincompoops. That's a word, the nincompoops that I've got to deal with. How do I do that, Rick? Fair question. Um, first, it's helpful to identify for yourself with regard to another person, or maybe even regard to something very specific, what you consider to be your own code. Your own code your standards. This will depend upon you know, how, you know, to some extent, the situation, the other person, to an extent. Um, it will also be shaped by your own culture, your own values. Okay, it's your code, but know what your code is. Know what um, your job description is as a good enough, fill in the blank, good enough coworker, a good enough friend, a good enough adult child of an aging and potentially dementing parent. Good enough, in my case, back in the day, a good enough father, a good enough husband. You know, decide for yourself what's in that code and what's in that 
job description, if you will, in terms of your duties or your tasks or the things there are to do in a relationship or situation. For example, in uh, the Noble Eightfold Path in Buddhism, you're probably aware of what's called right speech or wise speech, and it has essentially six criteria. Five of them are mandated. All five of them are mandated. One is desirable, but if need be optional. This is an example of a personal code. Uh, the six attributes of wise speech are speaking, you know, words. Then it gets interesting about words inside your own mind, but definitely words out loud that are well-intended, actually beneficial rather than harmful, true, which means that what's said is true. Not everything that is true needs to be said, but what is said is basically true. Timely and not harsh. That's an interesting one. Not harsh. Harsh depends on situations and cultures, right? What might seem, you know, way harsh, you know, <laughs> in California <laughs> may just seem like an everyday way of talking in New Jersey or something like that. I don't know. But the point is not harsh, you know, not overwhelmingly rageful, not full of derogatory language, not vicious, not nasty, not inflammatory, not harsh. Okay. Well, those are the five that are required, for example. So I nominate them to you as characteristics of your own code of unilateral virtue. And then the sixth desirable but optional condition is speech that is wanted by the other person. And I think about often I've, uh, you know, I've offered my uh, infinite wisdom, <laughs> my advice, my take, my counsel, my, my long story about something. It wasn't particularly wanted, and I really didn't need to say it. Sometimes, though, they don't want to hear it, and you know what? You're still going to tell them because to you, that seems like the virtuous and appropriate thing to do, including those aspects of virtue that have to do with supporting yourself too. Don't leave yourself out among all the beings that you treat with decency, kindness, and care. So right there, we have examples of um, you know, a code. You might think about uh, even more concrete sort of ground rules uh, in interactions, including tricky interactions. Yeah, it'd be great if they lived by those ground rules, but how about you live by them for a while and then you're in a really stronger position to actually name the ground rules you've been operating by, such as not interrupting or sustaining full attention for at least minutes in a row until the other person has had their say. Starting by joining starting by talking about what you agree with or what you like or what feels good to you about what the other person has said. Maybe that's a ground rule. Certainly for yourself, perhaps for both of you in interactions. That's a really powerful one. Start by joining rather than a detached, objective, advice-giving or critical position, a fault-finding position. Start by joining. Um, you might... Um, have a bit of a ground rule that you just say to yourself, you know, I'm a normal person. I'm going to experience anger or angry feelings from time to time, but I'm taking on board a personal standard that I'm going to try really hard not to speak or act from the anger. Now, it may be the case that as soon as you establish your standards for yourself, you know, what constitutes unilateral virtue for you, you may notice, as I have when I've started doing this, whoa, how many times whoop, you swerve away from really, really, you know, perfect pitch, really, really zeroed in to the um, way you want to be. But then you just notice it. Okay, we're not perfect. It's like the way that the um, five basic precepts in Buddhist morality are, are identified is that they're described as undertakings. We undertake the training of not killing any living thing, directly, at least ourselves. We undertake the training of not taking what isn't freely offered. We undertake the training of uh, no sexual misconduct. We undertake the training 
of not being intoxicated by one thing or another. We undertake the training of not speaking falsely. See, these are trainings, right? So you could undertake the training as it were, because it is a training to engage in unilateral virtue. A little, a few other things about what might constitute for you your, your code, your code of conduct, your way of being. Um, and, you, and you might, you know, write some of this down actually. It can really serve you, you know, to kind of put down almost do's and don'ts, right? With regard to important relationships, maybe with regard to your kids. Boy, I sure wish I had taken on board some subtleties and not always so subtle of unilateral virtue when our kids were, were teenagers. You know, I would have stayed out of more trouble uh, with them. Nothing horrible, but could have stayed out of trouble better. Um, fundamental principle of non-harming. You know, are you th thinking something or saying something or doing something that is fundamentally beneficial or frankly harmful to another person just because you want to get something off your chest? Uh, are you building up rather than tearing down? Are you constructing rather than destructing? Uh, when other people are with you, would they be able to say genuinely that they felt held in your heart, even if you disagreed with them or disapproved of them or opposed them politically and otherwise? Would people be able to say to you after being with you that they felt really heard? They may not have felt agreed with, and you're not necessarily going to do what they want you to do, but you you really heard them. You were big enough to receive them fully into yourself. That's a, that's a standard to take on board. Did the other person, after interacting with you, feel fundamentally, even if they weren't willing to admit it, but deep down, did you regard them as a thou rather than an it? Were you prepared to really recognize the being behind their eyes, you know, when you were with that other person? Um, you know, these are po possibilities that you might want to include in your own path of unilateral virtue. Maybe unilateral virtue includes some very concrete things. One of the things that um, really landed on me early in our um, parenthood very soon after our son was born, um, I realized that my previous way of operating, in which Jan was kind of her own independent person, I was my independent person, and you know we checked in with each other. We tried not to step on each other's toes, but we didn't really owe each other very much. Boy, as soon as that child came along, and you know Jan was nursing him and you know doing a lot of the care, boom, she depended on me in a way I had never recognized before. And I needed to boom, have the veils drop and really see, whoa, my life as I know it is over. <laughs> you know, it's changed forever. Not because I was come, not because I'm a good guy, but just because it's my job, right? To just do my share and take her into account. So sometimes there can be really concrete where you realize, you know, unilateral virtue means doing my full appropriate share of the housework around this joint. Unilateral virtue means being on time, finally. Maybe it means um, not being buzzed, especially not when driving or not when I'm dealing with my kids. Maybe unilateral virtue means, you know, I'm going to bring a whole heart and a full my full attention into regular conversation with my partner. Whoa, I'm actually going to ask her questions about what it's like to be her these days, her in her world, what she's thinking, what she's feeling, what she's longing for. I'm actually going to ask her to say more about it. Whoa. Or maybe unilateral virtue is, is kind of dusting off some of those requests from your partner that you're aware of and thinking, you know, maybe I really could bring, you know, a whole heart and full attention to more affection more erotic contact perhaps with my partner. You know, what might be concrete for you uh, in regard to unilateral virtue? Okay, to finish, the point of all this is not adding, oh my God, one more exhausting to-do item to your checklist. 
it's up to you to decide. I actually have found that there's a kind of fundamental uh, peacefulness in identifying for yourself what is your own code of integrity so that at the end of each day, you really can go to sleep knowing that you lived in integrity with your own deeply felt moral system. What's your job description, to put it in a kind of crass and fundamental way, with your partner or your family or your kids or your literal job or business? You know, what's, what's on you to do each day? How much effort to make is appropriate? Uh, what kind of things are you supposed to get done? You know, so that when you're all done, you've been a uh, fill in the blank. In my case, uh, good enough father, good enough husband, good enough human. Um, all together, right? Know that for yourself. And when you know it for yourself, wow, you can enjoy what the Buddha called the bliss of blamelessness. You can let go of unreasonable anxiety that you didn't do everything you were supposed to do. You can disengage from those nagging voices inside, from all those people who yappity yappy at you over the years. Ugh, no, you know, I'm doing a good enough job. I am good enough. Believe me be, right? You need to know what is good enough to know that you've done good enough and that you've been good enough, right? There's tremendous peace in this. It goes to, in effect, two different kinds of motivation, um, pushing and pulling. I've been thinking more and more about this. Yes, we can push ourselves to do good and be good to do various things. We can push ourselves to, to scratch and claw our way uphill. That works for a while. There's a place for it, but it's exhausting. On the other hand, we can give ourselves over to wholesome motivations so that they pull us along. That feels completely different. We can feel lived by our unilateral commitments, our unilateral code of integrity, our unilateral um, tasks that are ours to do over the course of a day, we can feel lifted by them, kind of pulled along by them. And that feels much less stressful and frankly wonderful. Yeah. Okay. So I want to take a look out to the um, chats that have come in. And uh, I'm really happy to talk about concrete nightmare scenarios. Uh, if you put something in the chat that you, it goes to everybody, they'll see your name, and I'll use your name. And if you just want to write me individually, I'll describe the situation potentially if I pick it. Uh, but I'll leave your name out because it'll be, um, I'll just say anonymous. Okay, great. Um, let's see here. Questions, comments coming in. Aha. So let's just start here with, with Fran's iPad at 6.51 p.m. Pacific time. Fran writes, I volunteer on a committee and a new person has made himself the chair. He takes my work and presents it as his own. He gives the entire committee Napoleonic orders. I feel my entire willingness to help evaporate. Is it best just to resign? I can still participate as a member of the community. All right. So, great question. I don't know specifically, um, you know, what you ought to do in that situation. And I just want to kind of note in passing that maybe, probably, there's some gender dynamics in play here because I cannot tell you the number of women, including our daughter, who've described situations like this where some guy pushes forward and then just starts taking credit and throwing his weight around. Um, so let's suppose you want to stay in the committee. <clears throat> and I want to kind of walk through an example of possibly unilateral virtue here. So there you are, and you, and you identify to yourself on this committee, what is your contribution to make and what is your job? What are your duties, as it were, on the committee? And know those for yourself. What are they? Okay? That. Now, 
Uh, and then can you see your way clear to actually doing those? Now, maybe part of your contribution as you see it is to speak up in the meetings and um, speak truth for a good intent, not to score points or to pay back that jerk of a new chair, much as he may deserve it. That's not your purpose if you're operating with unilateral virtue, but you're there to, for example, name truth. So, for example, if, you're, if you want to contribute an idea and you start explaining it and then he interrupts you, you can name truth right there unilaterally and virtuously with right speech. Say something on the order of, no, I'm, I'm still talking. Uh, please let me finish. Just that alone can be shockingly valuable and send ripples and reverberations in a group of people. Uh, if, for example, uh, he presents one of your ideas as his own, after he's done speaking, you could name truth unilaterally and say something like, you know, thanks so and so. And, you know, for the record, I was the person who initially suggested that. Just speaking truth here and leave it be. So there are things we can do in situations that involve unilateral virtue that are not quarrelsome, they're dignified, they're direct, they're appropriate, and they're very, very powerful, potentially. Over time, you might come to see that this situation is not fertile ground for your gifts. There are too many obstructions to giving what you have to give, and you might resign and look for some other place to make your contribution, some other ground that's more fertile for the seeds you know, that you're casting upon it. Uh, and you know that's a separate matter. But meanwhile, I have found many situations where just simply in a way that's kind of self-contained, you do your job. You don't take on board that other people, what those other people are doing. You don't get caught up in contentiousness with them while also feeling utterly free to, to name truth, to speak truth for your own sake so that you know you have said it and often for the sake of others. Okay, hopefully that's relevant here. All right, let's try to da, 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 da. Um, Oh, that's great, Karen. You're seeing your own development here. Let's see, any questions or comments that I can speak to? And then otherwise I'll bounce out. I see two people so far, Evelyn and Catherine. Great. So Arjuna writes, it's 7.04 p.m. Rick, I'm struggling with ongoing emotional turmoil as a result of an act of betrayal by someone who I respected and trusted very much. How can unilateral virtue help me deal with this? Whoosh. Well, first, internally, um, we you know, try to ride out the storm, deal with our reactions, have compassion to our, for ourselves as we can. If, it's, if there's action to take that maybe involves other people, maybe sometimes involves the police in the extreme, you know, things like that, you know, what, we do what we can. Second, with regard to unilateral virtue, you might ask yourself, um, what do you want to do? And then generally unilateral virtue um, is, how we do, is often how we do it. So for example, you might say to yourself, you know, I want to write a letter to this person. Okay, if you think that's a wise thing, okay. And then you might take a look at how you express yourself in that letter. Are you practicing right speech in that letter, even if you call him out really intensely or call them out, whoever they are. Um, yeah, uh, call them out um, with regard to what happened. So it can guide you that way. If, you, if you're talking about this situation with other people who are maybe friends of yours or allies with yours, you can practice unilateral virtue in how you talk about it. Now, in the beginning, it, you know, sometimes we just let it rip and then we clean it up later. Okay. And that's where unilateral virtue can come in retroactively sometimes. You know, we don't always have to be so perfect. But after you kind of get it off your chest and you spew for a while, and let's be clear, we can spew virtuously right? We can kind of rant and we can be angry and our hands can fly, a little spittle can come out of the mouth. All right, we're fuming, but we haven't 
tipped into viciousness or prejudice or evilness, you know, or thoughts of horrible sadistic vengeance with regard to that other person, you know, that would not be so virtuous, right? So there's room to breathe. There's room to breathe. We're, we can be full-throated, open-hearted, whole-hearted human beings with big feelings while still doing so within the larger frame of our own personal code of conduct as we decided for ourselves. And then maybe the last thing is that, um, you know, with your, think about this other person. One of the benefits of practicing unilateral virtue is more and more you develop a kind of moral self-confidence. I don't mean self-righteousness or superiority. I just mean a moral self-confidence that you know in ways large and small, most of them, when no one was looking, you were a stand-up person. You kept your head up and you did the right thing, even if it was hard, even when no one was looking. And you know this about yourself increasingly as you do it as over time. And more and more, you just have a certain moral self-confidence you know, that can enable you if you are interacting with this person, or even if you're not interacting with this person, to know that you yourself would never have done that. It's a sad fact that many, many people disappoint. Many people will not take full responsibility. They will not learn. They, won't, they don't learn. They don't admit fault. They will not clean up the mess. They won't repair. That's a sad fact in scales from small all the way up to the halls of power. And, you know, we can recognize that while ourselves not falling sway, not doing that ourselves, or if we slip, admitting it, practicing the virtue of admitting fault. The Buddha was very big on the willingness to admit fault. They would actually have formal meetings. They still do in uh, the monastic tradition that began with the Buddha, now called the Theravadan branch of Buddhism, in which monthly, typically, monastics will gather to admit fault as they consider it to their community and you know, ask for forgiveness, essentially, kind of clean the slate and go forward. It's very important to be willing to recognize, whoops, I messed up and I need to clean it up and then we can move on. Um, so you can know that about yourself. You can know that you would never have done this to, to that person. And knowing that can, in a funny kind of way, bring you more peace with the fact that, yeah, they did it to you, unfortunately. Uh, even when you're dealing with them, you can just, with moral self-confidence that comes from unilateral virtue, keep your head high and have self-respect. That alone feels so good, wow when dealing with certain kinds of people. It's not that you're being all uppity and superior, as tempting as it may be, and I've given way to that temptation, sure, but you just kind of know, it's not my job to make you be a good person, that other person. It's not your job to make them be a good person or to do the right thing. You wish they would, but that's not on you. That's on them. That's their burden. That's their responsibility. That's their karma to manage, not yours, which is woof, <laughs> very peaceful to appreciate. Okay, I'm gonna see if we could go out to Evelyn's. I like your last name, Evelyn. So uh, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. And I say this to everybody, Evelyn. Um, I ask that questions be succinct and very specifically related to what we're talking about tonight for general interest. Okay, go for it. Okay. So I don't know if this is going to make a lot of sense without giving the background information, but I'm going to give it a try to make it short. So I have an older sibling who likes to dominate. And um, I would say, you know, for the past two years, um, I, I would best describe it as being bullied by her, put downs and that kind of thing. And so a year and a half ago, I sent her an email and I said, you know, if there is something that I have done wrong, please let me know so I can make amends. And 
that didn't happen. She just uses this vague, you know, you push my boundaries kind of thing, but won't tell me what her boundaries are or how I push them. And, and she's, you know, told me I can't come to her house. And, um, you know, that's where it probably it doesn't make a lot of sense because there's a lot of background information. But at anyway, any rate, Evelyn, have you brought this up before? I think you talked about this before. Um, Did maybe you with a me? long time ago, but okay. anyway, here's my right. point. So what's, what's the question specifically? Okay. Uh, very recently, she's been making overtures to um, improve the relationship. Meanwhile, I have made a real effort to shrink it for my own um, uh, health. And now she's wanting to open things up again. And I just really feel reluctant to do so. I feel like it would be virtuous of me to do so and to forgive and um, bring her back into my life. But I, I, I've gotten to the point of peace and right. resolution. And so um, what would you advise? Well, I, now, now I get it. So it, it sounds like, understandably, you're right at that question of what is my my duty? What is what should I do? And uh, we all grapple with that question, so I can't exactly answer it. I find it really helpful to um, ask yourself what is your duty to yourself, not just to other people. On the one hand. On, on the other, also, I find it helpful to ask oneself, what would give me the greatest peace here? And, you know, this is where you get to decide for yourself, but it may be that it would give you the greatest peace to take one small step on the higher road and then see what happens. So that might look like one small step of deeper contact with your older sister and then see what happens. Maybe it includes uh, a kind of statement about how you would like each of you to be. This is one nice way to talk about unilateral virtue in relationships. You're not saying I want you to be a certain way or I request that you be a certain way. It's more like you're saying for each of us, um, you know, I hope that we, we don't tip into criticism or um, you know unwanted advice and you know I'm certainly happy to to abide by that or you know I hope we can listen to each other deeply I hope that we can each take about the same amount of time when we're interacting together you might say that yeah the communication has really um, pretty much um, become very scarce uh, but I I sent her an email and I said, I care about you. Yeah. I care about your family. I'd love to get news once in a while, but mm -hmm. that was it. <laughs> yeah, so you're setting a boundary. So that, that's up to you. I'm gonna, I guess I better leave it here because I think you have to look inside your own heart and to find that balanced place. Um, you know, I, I generally, You know, I really don't know. I don't know, Evelyn. I think sometimes there are certain people that we just kind of recognize them after a while. They're just sort of toxic. And you may know the teaching story of the scorpion and the tur and the tor turtle, you know, getting across the river and the scorpion stings the turtle uh, halfway across the river. And the turtle says, why did you do that? We're now both going to drown and die. And the, tur the scorpion shrugs and says, well, it's just my nature. You know, like sometimes we recognize that certain people are essentially scorpions and we just keep our distance from them. We're done. On the other hand, we sometimes we realize that we're with people who are pretty flawed. They're complicated. They've got different compartments, as it were, inside their own mind. And we start to kind of ignore uh, certain aspects of them while just staying focused on certain positive, beautiful parts of them. And that's how we relate to them going forward. So you'll, you'll find your way. You'll find your way. And just maybe a way to know it is your process is virtuous. You're being, you know, make sure, you know, if you know to yourself, you're being honest with yourself, 
you don't have hatred in your heart, uh, you're taking the long view, uh, you know, you, you know, then what will develop based on that good process is again something you can trust for yourself. Okay. All right. I'm going to keep going here. Um, let's see. Let me make a response to something that came in um, anonymously that, that might be relevant here, which is, what does non-harming mean? What does non-harming mean? Well, for example, what if 100 people are applying for a job, only one person will get the job? Does that mean that the person who got the job has harmed those, the 99, who don't get the job? Or what if you are speaking truth in a certain situation that makes other people uncomfortable? Maybe the truth you speak is that you're just not interested in them romantically like they're interested in you. Well, or maybe the truth you speak is you're naming the ways in which they are acting unjustly. And yeah, they don't like it. They don't like it. So this gets really interesting. Somebody asked a really good question about that. And I know who you are. I'm looking at you. And um, so, but it's a general one. I really wanted to speak to it right now and then maybe you know, give you a chance to comment on it. Um, so we have to decide for ourselves what our duties are to other people in terms of not making them uncomfortable. And my own view about that is that the path of unilateral virtue is very helpful in this regard. Because if you know for yourself, you have functioned within the frame of right speech, your intentions have been good, you've been sincere, and it actually serves the greater good for you to do something, or that it's your right in the rough and tumble of human relationships, that the same right you would give to another person to make you uncomfortable by speaking unwelcome truths to you. If you would give that right to others, you certainly can claim it for yourself. This is a really useful ethical principle. And um, so if you know that you've operated in this way and they're uncomfortable, you can have compassion for their discomfort without feeling that you have harmed them. And certainly without feeling that you are morally culpable in some that you deserve to feel guilty about their discomfort. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so uh, I'm going to bounce back to you, Catherine, in a second. But you know, David, that was your question. So I'm asking you to unmute and see if you have any comment on what I've said. Uh, well, that was very helpful. The question I wanted to ask actually went, and I saw that other people were interested in it as well. As a longtime striver, yeah, a, a veteran striver, I would love to be. Bold more and ah, that motivation. Yeah, we could talk more about the what that really means to be pulled towards something. How do you distinguish? You know, yeah, I want to be a good guy tomorrow. Uh, how do I get pulled along into that versus? God darn it! I'm gonna. <laughs> be yeah, yeah, it's a it's great. We so I'll, I'll definitely come to you, Catherine. So give me a minute or two here, Max, probably. So a okay, quick example. A uh, long time ago, so I've been a rock climber. A long time ago, I climbed the east face of Mount Whitney by the face. Uh, it's a pretty hairy thing to do, and so I trained to 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 do it. So I ran four miles. I'd go to the gym and I'd run four miles. And this was an indoor track. So eat. I had to run around the track maybe twelve times for one mile. And I started to play with the experience of shifting from how I was originally doing it, like pushing myself. You know, you're tired. You've got to keep your legs going, pushing myself to do it. I started imagining there was this golden rope of light attached to my chest that was being spooled forward by some kind of co cosmic spool there on the other side of the finish line at the four-mile mark that was pulling me forward. And it felt completely different. Right. Similarly, in this territory of unilateral virtue, um, you, you know, it's kind of like, are you inspired or are you doggedly clawing your way forward? Right. Uh, are, are you in touch with an innate lovingness or generosity or commitment to others? And is it that underlying generosity or good heart uh, or self-actualization? that is lifting you and moving you forward. 
it's kind of like that. And I think in some ways we could define this kind of will as surrendering to the best within us. You kind of fall back, kawoosh, into the, the warm currents of the best within you, and they are what's moving you forward. That can feel very, very different. It's like your ego, your contracted self kind of gets out of the way. Uh, and, you know, other deeper, vaster parts of you start start moving through you in the words you're using and, and how you're showing up. There's a real shift there. And when we're in, in more of that pull motivation, what's interesting is we're not uh, subjected to negative emotions so much. We're not irritated or, or annoyed or anxious right, or prideful in how we're trying to move forward. And also, when you're in that pull place, it doesn't feel so driven. Even if there's not negative emotion, we don't have the contraction and the pressure of drivenness when we're pushing our way forward, even if we're you know, enthusiastic in some way. Um, so pulling motivation has much less wear and tear on the body-mind over time and uh, therefore much less cost to us over time. That's kind of what I meant by that. And play around with that. Check it out, including in relationships. Okay? All right, great. So I know we're getting close to the end here. We're past the end. Uh Uh-oh. But Catherine, you've been a really good sport. So I want to ask you to unmute, and then you can unmute yourself. Great. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, So... My my question is pretty precise, I think, to today and pretty mundane example, but still something I struggle with. See, I'm usually the listener. Uh, People have always confided in me. I have a hard time when even really nice people, people I have a lot in common with, they can't help it. They keep cutting me off. I usually give them a couple of times. And then sometimes I'll say, uh, you know, can I just finish that threat that story and they go oh oh sorry but then they do it again and again and again and I find you know if I maintain that boundary of like well I have a right to be heard here and I keep struggling to be heard so I'll just pull back so will they you know maybe I it feels like we lose a chance to maybe Mm -hmm. make a friendship but on the other hand I don't see many people present enough to realize oh shit I'm not listening like she's right I'm not trying to make you the bad person here but yeah. I feel like I'm always in this position of holding up the mirror to, to this behavior, but with very nice people. Like, so I'm just curious what you'd say to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a couple of things here. <coughs> I feel for you, first off, and gender may play a role. Gee, I wouldn't be surprised in that bit. Um, so... There's this very powerful kind of move, like in a chess game or or dance, a move in which we go up to the meta level and we comment on the process. And that sounds all very therapeutic because, of course, we therapists, you know, do that routinely. But for example, just let me role play it slightly with you a little bit and then we'll wrap it up with everybody. Um, So... Basically, let's suppose that I'm Catherine and you're that other person. And, you know, first time you notice it, second time you go, okay, I get it. There's a pattern here. Two points to find a line, right? Three points to find a plane. <laughs> Three strikes, you're out, okay? Two strikes, you're on notice. Three strikes, yeah, I see that. So let's say it's happened three times, maybe, let's say. So I might say, pardon me, uh, Bob, you're Bob. Pardon, uh, Bob, I've noticed that three times already, you've actually interrupted me. I was talking and you just jumped right in and it, there wasn't a natural pause there. It, you just really jumped in. And I like you. I want to get to know you better, you know, not romantically, but I'm, I'm good with what we're doing here. I want to get to know you more, but I've got to feel like there's roughly 50-50 room in this interaction and in this relationship for both of us, for me and for you. So I just kind of want to check that out with you and see if you recognize what I'm talking about and what you think we could do about it. 
Now that's very West Coast, that's very therapeutic, that's very Rick, but you know, the essence of it is right there, which is fearlessly, without hostility, but without fear, naming what's the case, even if, you know, it makes Bob uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, what do you what do you make of that? Well, the next step, like when you said that, what triggers me is, oh great, now they're gonna tell me all their issues, why they're having trouble listening. And I'm gonna be stuck listening to that next and counseling it. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I hear you. That's what I hear happens you, but, to me. Yeah. So this is why it's like a hard loop to get out of, you know? Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and right there, you might claim for yourself unilaterally the willingness to interrupt Bob. So if Bob starts going off on his thing, you, you might hypothetically interrupt and say, so sorry, actually, I want to stay on topic. This is another important detail, topic control. Whose topic are we talking about? And a lot of other people, they're going to want to swerve away from your topic. And no, 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 50-50, <laughs> even Stephen, your topic, my topic. Now we're on my topic. We'll get to your topic later, Bob, about how no one ever listened, nobody ever listened to you. And you just really appreciate how I'm such a great listener. And I remind you of your therapist and <laughs> the mother you never had. Oh, great. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> You know, like that. A lot of the time it gets into this like competition of the stories. I tell a story, they don't acknowledge, there's thinking already of their story, parallel yeah. story. You know, it's the parallel story competition thing that, yeah. that often is a hard one to get out of too. So yeah, no, I'm pretty good at this staying on topic if we're into it. And they and they just like squirrel, you know, I'm pretty good at that one. But yeah. Anyway, yeah. I just oh, uh, yeah. I guess, like, giving yourself the right to go three strikes, you're out, and and call call it in a nice way is is still being spiritual and nice to people. Oh yeah, and and to be willing to to name what's happening while it's happening, that's extremely powerful, including in not in, I mean obviously if you're a therapist or your client that puts you in a certain position, but I just mean with people in general, and it often doesn't have to be that big a deal. People can often kind of get it. Uh, and you know, to just name what's obvious as we finish here, we walk into conversations, even very casual, informal ones in the elevator between the first and the 20th floor. We walk into that in ways that are socially situated based on structural things. So I walk in, I'm tall, I'm male, uh, I'm older, uh, you know, I have a certain verbal facility, a certain, you know, clout there. That gets me listened to more easily. It's not fair. It's a fact though. Let's say you walk in and you seem like such a nice, nurturing, I'm going to use a really horrible word here, maternal. <laughs> You know, oh, no, it's fine. I, yeah, I recognize yeah. it, yeah. Yeah, a really nice, nurturing person. So immediately, I, you know, people tend to slot you into a certain situation in which it's harder. I want to acknowledge that it's harder. It's harder for people who look like you on average than it is for people who look like me to get other people to shut up and make room for you, you know, you to talk. I just want to acknowledge that. that my, Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's harder. It really is harder, which means necessarily, and again, it's not fair. And after a while, people can get exhausted doing the, this work for other people. Yes, other people should understand that themselves coming in, especially now and, you know, nearly nearing the end of 2021. Poof. But still, it's a fact that a lot of other people are resisting the training. You know, <laughs> They don't want to get the training. And there you are. And sometimes what that means is that you might have to be firmer or more pointed than someone who looks like me has to be, which is just not fair. But it may be just a fact on the ground. And then you can decide whether it's worth it to you to do that. Yeah, it's fine. I think it's finding the right firm phrases that are firm enough but make me but i still feel confident or still being uh compassionate enough to the other person yeah. so figuring yeah. that out uh, yeah that that's helpful thank you <laughs> yeah i think it's possible also to and i'll finish on this point really fast unilaterally to prod people a bit 
to nudge him, to inquire. And right there is the test of character. You know, the movie Dune is coming out and you know may know that story or the book, or there's a test early on about how people handle stress, including great stress. And uh, we see things about people. So, um, you know, it might be a place where you can feel more entitled to just slow somebody down and say, no, no, actually, before we go any further, I'd love to know what you thought about what I just said. Or I'd love to know what you felt inside when I said this part. Did you relate to it? See what I mean? I think there's a place sometimes for just kind of burrowing more into the mind of the other person. It, not in a way that's invasive or superior, but in a way that is kind of, makes it more real. You know, rather than a superficial chat at this level, gets down to like more realness. And you'll find that some people just freak out. They turtle up, they wanna get away, they don't wanna engage at that level of depth. They're just, they don't wanna give you that kind of access to their interior. All right, that tells you about that person and the likely depth of your future relationship, not very. On the other hand, my experience, especially if, if you do this and you're, you're brave yourself and you're vulnerable yourself, appropriately vulnerable, Maybe one person in five, maybe more, one in three, their eyes light up. It's like, all right, great. We're having a deeper, more fruitful, richer, juicier kind of conversation. 